Welcome to Design for the Creative Mind, a podcast for interior designers and creative entrepreneurs to run their business with purpose, efficiency, and passion. Because while every design is different, the process should remain the same. Prepare yourself for some good conversations with amazing guests, a dash of Jesus, and a touch of the woo-woo, and probably a swear word or two. If you're ready to stop trading your time for money and enjoy your interior design business, you are in the right place. I'm your host, Michelle Lynn. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to Design for the Creative Mind. This is a business podcast for creatives, whether you're an interior designer or an artist or anybody who has the left brain and the right brain in conflict on occasion. Um, Today, I am so excited to have Jamie Lieberman here. She is the owner and founder of Hashtag Legal. She's been a practicing lawyer for 16 or so years, serves creatives, serves all sorts of people around the country on a variety of different platforms, including what we're going to talk about right away because I just found out about it and I'm super excited. She started a new biz, a new podcast. It's called the Unbusiness Podcast. So since you're here on this podcast, you can go check out her podcast. And hello, welcome, Jamie. I'm super excited. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, it's so much fun. So we're going to talk about all things, well, not all things law, but we're going to talk about when do you involve an attorney? We're going to talk about some negotiation, but because we were just talking about it before I hit record on this podcast, you were telling me about your new business podcast called the Unbusiness Podcast and how you are talking about, comp- like, tell the audience what you were just telling me in regards to how you're doing it in seasons and what your topic is right now. Yeah. I think they will be really interested in hearing that. Thank you. I'm very yeah. excited about it. As you know, as a fellow podcast host, podcasts mm-hmm. are a labor of love. So we put <laughs> yes. a lot of work into it. Um, and yes, we just launched. Um, there are now today is the fourth episode is live. By the time this goes live, there will probably be more. But what we decided to do, you know, as a lawyer who helps business owners, particularly creators and creatives, we tend to deal in a lot of heavy stuff. Some of it is like really positive and amazing because we're growing and building, but legal just sort of terrifies everybody. And so I wanted to create a podcast that provided information to these business owners in a much more manageable way that didn't feel so formal. And so I decided to do it in seasons because oftentimes a lot of the topics I talk about, they're dense. And so we kicked off with season one, all about conflict management and conflict conflict resolution for business owners, because that is really the most vulnerable. I think business owners come to me is when they're in times of conflict, whether it's with a client or a vendor or an employee or a contractor or a partner. I mean, we could talk about conflict all day. And so we dove deep into like tools and stories and ways that you can get more comfortable with managing conflict because it's a reality of any business. Absolutely. And it's not something that most people are comfortable with. Right. And especially in, in the interior design industry, because a lot of us are women <laughs> and hell, we're nurtured from the get-go to be nice. Yep. So that is, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm going to, so stick around, don't hang up on this podcast and hop over to hers right now. We're going to, we're going to dive deep into a couple of other things and then go check it out. And I'm going to do the same thing. Now, you had another pod. You were doing a podcast before. I was. Yeah. And so did you just sunset that? We did. So I had a partner. Um, she was awesome, a co-host. And we just sort of got to a place with the podcast where we're like, all right, I think we've said what we wanted to say. I mean, we had hundreds of episodes and it just sort of took a direction where we decided it was time to sort of shut that one down. So mm-hmm. we did. Um, and thankfully there was no conflict. We're still very, very good friends. <laughs> um, but I decided that I wanted to do something on my own specific to the topics that were, you know, just most kind of top of my mind and the things that really people come to me and ask me about all the time. And, you know, we can't help everybody. And sometimes people just need a resource from um, an expert that Mm -hmm. uh, at least will give them some basic information. Well, and I love the fact that you're spreading it out and going deep into each topic with the seasons. That's huge. It's hard to, you know, we're going to talk obviously about a lot of things, legal issues, and we're going to really baseline hit it. I'm going to give really basic Mm -hmm. information. And sometimes I feel like, you know, I could sit and talk for three hours, but nobody wants to listen to a lawyer talk for three hours. So, and I get that. (laughs) 
So, you know, I thought it would be a good way to make some of these really dense topics just a lot more manageable. That is awesome. So that kind of leads me into my first question in regards to um, when do you need to involve an attorney? Like, can I just go listen to the podcast and get some of this information? How do I know, or how do the listeners know it's time to actually pick up the phone and call somebody? It's time now <laughs> for anybody <laughs> listening. Yes, yes, so there's yes. a couple of different reasons that you're going to call a lawyer. We're going to call a lawyer in happy times because we're creating something, something new or something we've already created, but we haven't quite protected it yet. And so those are the best times to call. Those are the proactive times to call, which is why I say the time is now to call because mm-hmm. you probably have something in your business that you don't even realize you haven't protected or you know you just you don't know what you don't know. So having a relationship for a lawyer from the day you start your business is a great proactive thing to do. Now, many of you are listening and many of you have businesses and you're like, oh no. (laughs) So that is not an allowance for you to panic or any reason for you to like freak out and go immediately like, you know, Googling lawyers. Um, It's something you do. You could Google hashtag lawyer. (laughs) Hashtag legal. Yes. Hashtag legal. Yes. So, um, but yeah, so I I don't want you to freak out, um, but it's something that you should have in the back of your head. It is one of the many tools in your arsenal as a business owner that you should have. It's your lawyer, your accountant, you know, all the people who are the supporters of your business. Yes. Um, And I look at all of those professionals as risk assessors, because at the end of the day, when we're being proactive, it's really just helping you manage and minimize your risk. And that will depend on how you feel about risk. Some people are like, we're parachuting without a parachute, right? Like we're jumping out of that plane. We don't care. And when we hit the ground, we'll figure it out. Other people, they're like pausing at the stoplight and they're not crossing until they have a walk sign. There is, and everybody in between, Mm -hmm. and it is neither good nor bad. You just have to know who you are and what your risk profile is. And then we can create a strategy for you. So having that strategy up front, it's going to help you sleep at night because then we shift to the other side of things. And we have the people who are coming to me in the reactive that's the conflict. That's the fear. That's the, oh no, something is going wrong. And I'd say, you know, the majority of the people that come to me at first, they're coming to me because it's reactive. They're scared. Something's gone wrong. They're afraid they're going to lose things. Um, And so I would say it's always better to make that call. I know a lot of people have fears around how much it's going to cost, or the person's not going to be a fit for them. But until you make that call, until you have that consultation, you just don't know. Um, and so telling us ourselves a story about this is going to bankrupt me. If I ignore it, it'll go away. I've heard it all. Um, <laughs> Wait, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, it does not. If it did, um, I'd be in great shape, but yeah. So I think that, um, make the call because right. you, just, you have nothing that honestly, you have nothing to lose. Yeah. Well, and you don't, like you said, you don't know what you don't know. It's just like yeah. when a client calls an interior designer, you know, so many people think that they can do it themselves and yep. they try it and then they, <laughs> it doesn't work. And then they try it again. And they finally get to the point where they bang their head up against the wall. So many times they reach out yep. and it's, it's oftentimes such a pleasant surprise to realize just how easy the process is. And I'm sure that's the same thing with your clients. Yep. Yeah. It's kind of like going to the gym. I think it's always worse when you think about it, like right before your workout. (laughs) Yeah. You can't think about it. But I think the other thing is it's easy when you have the right connection. You know, I, and I'm going to use interior design. Mm -hmm. I'm actually in the process personally of renovating a home. And I knew immediately there was not a chance we were uh, doing this ourselves. Um, And so we interviewed quite a few interior designers and some of them, it didn't feel easy, not because there's anything wrong. They weren't a fit for us, but the one that was right, it was simple. Right. And so it's the same Mm -hmm. with lawyers. Like when you have that right call, it's Mm -hmm. just a fit. It flows. You got to go with your gut because you're interviewing that lawyer. They're interviewing you too. You got to make sure it's a fit like any professional service. Um, And so it should feel easy. It should feel like you're working together. They're a partner. They understand your business. You click personally and look, I get it. Like I am not for everybody. There are definitely some clients out there that I won't fit with. And that's okay. It's good Mm -hmm. for me to know that. It's good for them to know that. So knowing, uh, talking to a few people, making sure you feel comfortable with them. And then the one who feels easy, go there. Well, I was going to liken it to dating until you said if it feels easy. (laughs) It's like dating, right? Exactly. (laughs) We're friend dating, right? Like, you know, you get to a certain phase of your life where you're like, 
how do I make new friends? And, you know, it's oh my like gosh, yeah, that's dating. a whole other podcast. I totally yeah. agree. But, <laughs> but it's true. You have to figure out who you gel with in any yeah. instance and, yeah. and go from there. Y'all, this podcast episode was made possible in part by Foyer, a lightning fast interior design software that creates photo realistic renderings. I'm not kidding. You can barely tell that it's not a real room. So why leave your beautiful designs up to the imagination of your client when you can show them what their space is going to look like? You will sign more clients and get more approvals with this software. It's powered by artificial intelligence and I'll vouch for its ease because if I can do it, anybody can, because y'all know that my design team are the ones who do all the work. Find them in the show notes. So also you had said, you know, you need somebody now. Well, it's also, if you are going into business or if you've been in business for a bit, your contract, that is such a huge, I mean, that's, I mean, first of all, have a contract. If you don't have a contract, you need a contract, but it's also different um, by our industry. Mm -hmm. Like our industry has some crazy ass nuances Mm -hmm. and finding an attorney who understands that for me, when I was first starting off, was a huge challenge. I mean, that was back in 1902. Uh, you might have been around, um, but I, just knowing what I know now is is so true because I went through the heartache of adding things to the contract because they happened. Yep. And then having a lawyer sign off on it every single time was just ridiculous. You've worked with designers and understand some of those nuances. So that is such a huge um, you know, y'all, Jamie's not paying me as a commercial for this, but, um, <laughs> you know, I'm just, as you guys know, if you've been with me at all, I, I love to share as much as I possibly can and promote people who support our industry. And yes. if you're not sure, pick up the phone, get your contract looked at though. No, um, Jamie contracts vary by state. How do you and your business manage that? If I'm calling you from Texas and you are not here. Yeah. So we manage it on a case by case basis. We talk to the person, we see what their needs are. There are definitely instances where we say, this is not a fit for us and we'll refer out. Um, We have a network of lawyers that we work with if local issues come up, but it's always just best to have that conversation and say, can you do this? Can you help? Um, Mm -hmm. So it's really just done on a case by case basis to make sure that we're able to help because I'm never going to take, you know, an engagement from someone that I can't. So, and we work with people all over the country and we are able to do so in a lot of ways. So it's just really making sure that we're the right fit for that. But you are so, so right just in general about contracts. They are not one size fits all. Every single interior designer does business differently. That's just, I mean, and I say this all the time, Mm -hmm. interior designers have probably some of the most complex contracts. They just do. It is it's, it's because it's a complex business. Who correct. would have imagined? It is yes. so complicated. Interior designers, graphic designers, I know other creatives will listen. They mm-hmm. have very complicated as well. And that is because you are essentially, particularly with interior designers, you are probably as creatives, the most ref, right and left brained of the businesses, because mm-hmm. you cannot be a successful interior designer without being incredibly creative and being incredibly business savvy. You have mm-hmm. to marry the two. Um, and I actually find that pretty amazing how many incredibly talented designers are out there who are so, so business savvy. Um, and so those between the two, those two things, like there's just a lot that's involved in those contracts. And so there's just no one size fits all. You can't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, loads of people have tried, <laughs> but it doesn't work. And so, and like you said, you know, we can anticipate a lot. Like I work with so many interior designers. I know some of the most common pitfalls. Stuff will come up that we did not anticipate. And that happens. Oh, yeah. And we amend things and work through things. Your contract, I always joke, should be like kind of a living, breathing document. Like it should. It should grow with your business. It should absolutely change. You should be evaluating it every six months to a year just to make sure, just look at it. You know, we go, we sort of get a contract and we set it and forget it and we don't look back at it. And then when something happens, we go back and look at our contract. We're like, why is that in there? Or why did I write that? Or, oh man, I made that typo because I wasn't paying attention. And now what? So I I just think it's something that we don't want to necessarily deal with. Um, And in an ideal world, 
if we have a great relationship, we're never going to look at that contract again once it's signed. But that's just not reality, particularly in the interior design space. It's amazing. I remember getting into this business years ago and thinking, oh, I'm just going to make spaces beautiful yeah, <laughs> and make money off of it. And then holy crap, like you said, I mean, if the contract is is complicated, it's because the business is complicated. So yep. for all of y'all listening and wondering, it's true. This is not an easy business to be in, but having that contract also really protects both you as well as the client. So it's really, imperative. A really good contract is really is the life cycle of a design project from design to procurement to construction management to installation and rinse and repeat. Like it is, mm-hmm. it should detail every single phase that you're doing and how you charge for it. And the phases are often charged for differently. You know, I have designers who are doing flat fees for design, but then we're doing a percentage for construction management. And then we're doing a markup for procurement. And then we're doing another flat fee for installation and styling. I have designers who are hourly for everything. Like it, it is a Across the board, and I read them all. I see them all. So that's another benefit I have in my experiences. I know how everybody's pricing. <laughs> so <laughs> clients come to me and they're like, "What are you seeing?" And I start to see. I I absolutely start to see trends because clients are coming back to me, like a lot of my innovative clients, and are saying, I'm, "I want to do this a little bit differently. I want to sort of try to figure out. I'm, I I, I want to tweak this. I want to change this." And so your contract is truly the life cycle of your project. It, it is a roadmap. Um, and so the really, really good ones, you're going to be able to go back and you're going to say, okay, now I'm on phase three. These are all the things that I need to do. I'm going to check all those in my scope. Mm-hmm. I'm going to look at how I'm going to price it out. And your client's going to be like, this is amazing. Everything lines up and we're really, really happy. And that's the ideal world. First of all, that's amazing. I've just <laughs> taken some notes on that. I love the idea of the life cycle of your project. So that's yeah. This is one of the reasons why I love doing this podcast <laughs> and, and, and just interacting with so many people because there's always just that little nugget that you take away. But I was going to ask, so did you did you take that knowledge that you have about pricing and use it to negotiate your designer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did not do that to her. <laughs> I want her to be paid fairly. Uh, yes. And that's really uh, important. You are the dream client. Yes. She's providing a real, I mean, listen, I'm a professional services, mm-hmm. pro- professional services, professional. Um, I I'm also a client service person. And so yep. I want to be par- paid fairly. So anybody I hire, whether it's in my business or personally, I I'm going to mm-hmm. pay them fairly. That's just the way it should be. Yeah. Girl, and that is such, okay. So I'm getting off track because I was actually going to segue into negotiation and talk to you about that, but yeah. I want to point out what you just said, because one of the things that I really try to teach Um, as often as possible, is that as designers, we are professionals. Our clients are most often going to be professionals in their industry as well. Because if they can afford us, they're going to be professionals, okay? Just not everybody can afford design and that's okay. So to, to understand who I'm dealing with or who you're dealing with as an interior designer, you have to show up as a professional because that's who the professional is hiring, is another professional. Yep. So just remember that we, our ideal clients are, is somebody like you that will allow us to have that level of professionalism, creativity, financial rewards, and so forth. So, yep. okay. Back to negotiation. That was my, my own little commercial on the side. So negotiation is something that you are very adept at. Why is that a skill that designers or entrepreneurs should actually acknowledge and hone in on? Because everything we do is a negotiation. (laughs) I mean, really, Mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, dealing with a new vendor or if it's dealing with, and, and, and I want to back up from that and say, like, we have to stop looking at negotiation as this like really horrible thing that we're doing. Mm -hmm. It is literally to me, a collaborative process where two people come together and get a really awesome end result. I so get it's what not I, like arm wrestling, right? I'm not at a used car <laughs> dealership where I'm like, I will pay 5,000. And he said, the cost is 10,000. And I say 6,000. And he says 9,000. And that's right. not negotiation. <laughs> okay. That is bargaining is at the end of negotiation. Negotiation is collaborative. It's listening. It's me sitting down with a client or me sitting down with a vendor or me sitting down and saying, okay, like, this is what I need. 
What mm-hmm. do you need? And how are we going to come together? And like, it's like a little Venn diagram in my mind. Where's the middle, right? Where are we right. going to find? And that's not necessarily that $5,000, $10,000 example. Mm-hmm. There are so many currencies that we're negotiating. I mean, we're talking about not just like price, but we're talking about time. We're talking about portfolio use. We're talking about interviews. We're talking about social media. We're talking about, you know, referrals. We're talking about, like, there's so much that goes into understanding what's important to a client, what's important to a vendor what's important to an employee or a contractor, whoever you're negotiating with. You know, I even think about it. I I actually did a podcast episode with um, uh, a client and a friend of mine. She has a podcast episode about parenting and I did it about kids, negotiation and kids. And I am no child psychologist or expert, but we talked about how we take my negotiation framework, I actually put it towards working with my kids because there's this recognition that like my kids, they have needs too. I have two children. Mm -hmm. They have needs too. So they should be able to express those needs. They may not get what they want, (laughs) but they should be able, and I should try to find a way to get them there where I get what Mm -hmm. I need to, which is keeping them safe and happy and all those things. And obviously they want to watch TV for 65 hours a day, but there's a middle ground, right? So I think that, that when we look at negotiation, we really should be looking at it as a, you know, a collaboration and a a listening because it just makes it better. Once we get to the bargaining, if we sort of know what all the issues are and where we are, it's easy. So you can skip the mind reading and actually have that conversation. Let me interrupt myself to take a quick moment to thank Satinoff Insurance Agency for sponsoring this episode of the Designed for the Creative Mind podcast. Their support and understanding of the interior design, decorating, and home staging industries is unrivaled. Satinoff understands what our businesses do, and they provide insurance that lets me sleep at night. Yep. This is the firm that I use, and they will do the same for your sleep habits and your business too. They're more than an insurance agency. They're an extension of my business. They take care of the worry because they are the experts, which allows me and my team breathing room to do what we do best, design beautiful spaces. You can find their contact information below in the show notes. Give them a call today. So you said you have a framework for negotiation. Yes. How did you come up with that? And what does it kind of look like? Oh my gosh. So I actually, I'll give you a link. We have like a free download that kind of runs through um, all of it that I can give in uh, your show notes. It's years and years and years and years of experience. And also I was a professor um, at Seton Hall Law School and I taught lawyering and negotiation. So through sort of my work and through just all of the research and reading and my training, I just sort Mm -hmm. of came up with this like really sort of process that I go through in every negotiation. And so much of it includes research and listening and understanding, you know, getting information and then really honing in on like, what are the actual issues that we're negotiating? Because at the end of the day, when we start with, I don't even want to call it a conflict, but let's say a potential client, or, Mm -hmm. you know, you sit down with a client and they come to you and they're like, okay, I want my bathroom redone. Great. Let's start talking about that you start to pull things away, you start realizing, well, we're really good on budget here, um, but timeline's kind of an issue. So let's talk about timeline and what needs to get done in my workload and et cetera. And so once we start pulling away some of those excess that are actually not in dispute at all or up for conversation, Mm -hmm. it becomes easier to hone in on at that that end result. Um, So it's just a lot of research. It's a lot of listening. It's a lot of asking questions. um, Mm -hmm. It's a lot of strategy. Well, I love that because I think in in my experience, as I'm talking to designers all the time, a lot of times they're not showing up and asking questions because they think they should know something. Oh gosh. But it's such an interesting position that we put ourselves in because we're assuming things Mm -hmm. that may or may not be true when just asking questions is not a sign of weakness. It is research. It's actually incredibly flattering to the client. Mm -hmm. They love to be asked questions. Who doesn't want to talk about what they want? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) it's so true. Let's be real. People (laughs) like to talk about themselves and that's a good thing. Use that Um, and just listen. I mean, your client is going to feel so safe by you just asking questions about what they want and need. That's all that is. It's not, you're not trying to trick them or you're just getting Mm -hmm. information. So you have an understanding. I mean, we, that's, that's really what it comes down to. It's just really good conversation. I have a client who's a tech-based client because we do do work with tech companies and they use crazy tech jargon. And it happens that 
way back a million years ago, I was an engineer and I happen to understand technology, but there are some times that their people will come at me with a phrase and I'm like, I don't know what they're talking about. And I will literally say to them, Hey, you got it. What, can you just tell me what you're talking about? Because you're using (laughs) a phrase that I think I know what it means, but I, and I always say to them, I think I know what you're saying, but I don't want to make assumptions. So explain it to me. Like I'm a brand new person and I don't care if it's elementary or basic. I also sometimes just need to confirm my understanding's correct. And sometimes part of negotiation and part of that is repeating back to people saying, okay, if I'm hearing you, this is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing Mm -hmm. that in that bathroom scenario, I'm hearing like, we could spend all the money in the world, but this has to be done by the time that your in-laws come because they need a really nice bathroom. Otherwise it's not going to be a fun in-law visit. That's the kind of conversations that you need to repeat back. And as soon as they feel heard, they're like, oh, I feel safe. They, they know what I need. That is fabulous. And uh, y'all listening probably didn't expect that from a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> so Jamie, the next segment in the podcast is a fun little rapid fire Q and a that we're going to do. Is there anything that you want to leave our listeners with before we get into some fun and games? No, I think it's just, I hope the common theme that we've sort of come Mm -hmm. to is just like, get comfortable around asking for information about legal, get yourself covered. Don't avoid it. Even if you've been in business 30 years and you've never had a legal issue, that's incredible. I'm super happy for you. Stuff still can come up. So I just, you know, I get that it's a scary thing, but even just having an initial strategy session with an attorney, just so you understand where, you know, things can be improved or where your risks might be is just, Mm -hmm. it goes a long way. I probably should schedule one of those with you. (laughs) (laughs) Anytime. Yeah. Note to self. Hold on. Let me write that down. And then what we'll do at the end of our conversation is I'll make sure that everybody knows where they can find you. And we'll have all this information in the show notes as well. So before we get there, let's do this rapid fire. So it is just a way for the audience to get to know you a little bit better and uh, nothing's off the table. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> We're going to start off easy. Chocolate chip or oatmeal cookies? Chocolate chip. Red or white wine? Oh, it depends on what I'm eating. <laughs> <laughs> so both. Yes. <laughs> That's the answer. Who's your favorite superhero? Oh gosh. Wonder Woman. I've loved those new movies with Gal Gadot. She is just such a badass. Oh, I love her. She's awesome. Yes. yes very yes, good. Yes, I yes. wasn't a big fan of the 1984 one. That was a little painful to watch, but the original they've, one, it was good. Done well. yep. Yeah. So what did you want to be when you were growing up? Oh, an engineer. Which you did. I, well, I got the degree and then it was like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> You've just got a big brain. I, I like math and science. So. That's fun. Ugh. Moving on. What is your favorite form of exercise? Um, I take a really amazing boxing class. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. At a local gym here. That's my favorite. There you go. So yeah. Negotiation, even if you don't win. Yeah. Just (laughs) knock knock them out. out. (laughs) Are you a dog or cat person? Dog. What kind of dog? So unfortunately, everybody in my family, except for me, is allergic to dogs. <laughs> so oh. I know. So we do not have a dog, but my children go. very badly wish that they could. <laughs> so have you, and I'm getting so far off topic so, and so much not rapid fire, but I believe, so I've got a Morky and a Yorkie poo uh-huh. and they're, they're hypoallergenic. Not for my family, unfortunately. No, there is no such thing the as a hypoallergenic dog for my family. No, that makes um, sense. There are many people that absolutely can be allergic to dogs and have, but nope. right. Gotcha. <laughs> Some, it's something deeper than that dander. Yep. It's the saliva, it's actually, believe it or not. <gasps> not everybody is allergic. Oh, Most people are not allergic to dog saliva, but right. it happens that <laughs> there you go. <laughs> my family is. <laughs> And there you have it, y'all. Um, okay. So back on track, what is your favorite book? Oh my gosh. Um, I was just rereading, uh, cause she just passed away the year of magical thinking by Joan Didion. That is, oh. it will not, I mean, it is not happy. It is a tough book to read, but it is beautiful. Interesting. Joan Didion. Yeah. I'll have to look oh, her up. So good. Okay. Introvert or extrovert. I think we all know I'm an extrovert. (laughs) (laughs) If you had one superpower, what would it be? Oh, I might, I have this conversation with my kids all the time. I love it. I'd be invisible. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Sneaky. Yeah. <laughs> so I could actually spy and, on them. Is what and I then you could bring out your right hook. Yes. <laughs> um, what was the last time you took a nap? Oh, uh, I can't. Oh, I took a 10 minute nap on Sunday. Cause my husband took my kids out to the park and I was just for some time. Oh, and I was nice. just laying on the couch reading and I dozed off for 10 minutes and it was glorious. That's the best. Nice. Okay. Last one. If you could do anything other than what you're doing now as a profession, what would you be? I think a photographer. Interesting. There yeah. you go. There's yeah. still time. There's still time. You know, I kind of like this profession. So, <laughs> you know, there's a reason I never went with that profession, but that I do sense. love photography. Uh, and I love, I love working with photographers too, but it's, uh, mm-hmm. I love photography. I have a lot of respect. Well, now for we all have a, and, and now we all have a, a camera in our pocket with our phone. So I will just play with that. I have the amount of pictures on my camera. It's just, it's, I mean, my phone's going to just like, just one day, like wave a white flag and be like, please stop. I Although now it. my kids steal my phone and I find pictures of selfies of them. I found <laughs> six selfies of my younger son. I just opened it up. I was like, when did you do this? He fell off his chair. He's like, that was Saturday. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> how, oh how old are your God. kids? Uh, my uh, youngest is about to turn eight and my oldest <gasps> is 10. Oh, how fun. How fun. Yeah. That is amazing. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you. Hashtag legal. Um, I know our audience has loved everything you've shared. So let them know how they can connect with you. Sure. So our website is hashtag all spelled out dash legal.com. Um, we share a lot on Instagram, so you can find us there at hashtag all spelled out underscore legal. The end business podcast is you can find it just on the hashtag legal website or anywhere that you've listened to podcasts. Um, and those are the three best places. That is fabulous. And it's the unbusiness podcast. Yep. UN unbusiness. Yep. So fun. Thanks, Jamie, for being here. For those of you who could benefit from even more resources surrounding the business of running your interior design business, join the growing community on my Facebook private group. It's called the Interior Designers Business Launchpad. And don't forget to leave a review anywhere you're listening to this podcast. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks. Hey, y'all. If you love the show and find it useful, I would really appreciate it if you would share with your friends and followers. And if you like what you're hearing, want to put a face with a name and get even more business advice, then join me in my Facebook group, the Interior Designers Business Launchpad. Yeah, I know it's Facebook, but just come on in for the training and then leave without scrolling your feet. It's fun. I promise you'll enjoy it. And finally, I hear it's good for business to get ratings on your podcasts. So please drop yours on whatever platform you use to listen to this. We're all about community over competition. So let's work on elevating our industry one designer at a time. See you next time.